Hello, folks. Uh, this is the Apologetics Academy, a weekly uh, interactive webinar, which I run every Saturday at, um, in the evening. This week, we're a little bit uh, earlier than usual. Normally, we're at 8 p.m. British time, but this week, we're at 6 p.m. British time. And uh, um, if you want to check out the website, you can go to apologetics-academy.org. And if you click on online apologetics training, you can see the confirmed schedule for upcoming apologetics webinars. Um, there's a number of ways you can participate. You can uh, simply type away in the chat or sit and watch or listen, enjoy anonymously. Um, you can click the raise hand button at the top of your screen to, to uh, come up and interact with the speaker during the Q&A period. You can also submit questions in textual form by hitting the Q&A button at the top of your screen um, anonymously if you wish. Um, this evening, we are very honored to be joined by analytic philosopher, Dr. Lydia McGrew, who is um, um, quite well known for her work in uh, analytic philosophy and also uh, more recently in New Testament uh, studies. Um, she's been on a few times before discussing things like undesigned coincidences and such. She's the author of uh, Hidden in Plain View, Undesigned Coincidences in the Gospels and Acts, which I highly recommend to your reading. Um, so um, without further ado, let me just turn over to Lydia. She's going to be talking about uh, this, this evening uh, on the topic of only one Jesus, looking at uh, the popular contention among many scholars that the Jesus presented in John's gospel is different from that presented in the synoptics. So over to you, Lydia. Great to be on here. Thank you, Jonathan. I'm probably going to go to a share screen mode at this point, and you'll be able to see my, my PowerPoint. So I'm going to do that and talk to you about only one Jesus. Let's go ahead and do that. There's my PowerPoint slideshow. It's been, I've been advised to give my audience an overview of where we're going, because this is going to be, as, as my talks tend to be, kind of a little bit long. And uh, this is a version of a talk I gave a few weeks ago for the Christian Apologetics Alliance regional group that met here in Michigan, but I've added a few things to it. So I'm going to start with pointing out scholars' negative treatment of John's portrait of Jesus so that you can see why I'm doing this. You know, why, why, what does John in particular have to do with this question of there being only one Jesus? Then I'm going to go into positive evidence for the unity of the portrait of Jesus throughout the Gospels and particularly between John and Matthew, Mark, and Luke, known as the Synoptic Gospels. Uh, Evidence of unity from Jesus' personality, evidence of unity from shared language between them in uh, all kinds of different areas. I'm going to have a lot of examples there. Evidence of unity from what's thought of as especially Johannine language that shows up surprisingly in Matthew, Mark, and Luke in the Synaptic Gospels. And then I'm going to address several additional potential objections to the view that I'm putting forward that these are unified and that John is just as historical as the other three Gospels. And no less historical, he's not doing more massaging of history or of Jesus' character. So I'm going to address that at that time. The difference between these two points here, between the um, unity from shared language and unity from Johannine language, is that um, the shared language won't necessarily concern something that people think of as Johannine, but just things that's rather surprising, you know, to see Jesus using very similar language in John and in the Synoptic Gospels. So it's an overview of where we're going to go here. So I want to start with the negative treatment of John with, uh, within the world of New Testament scholarship. And my examples here are going to come from evangelical scholars. As I've done in the past, it would be easy to find examples from Bart Ehrman. In fact, when Bart Ehrman uh, debates anybody. You'll see this as a trope. When he's attacking the reliability of the Gospels, he goes straight for John, and he clearly thinks of that as going for the jugular, that John is a weak spot. And unfortunately, uh, many who debate him are all too willing to concede that. So I want to give some examples of that. Craig A. Evans is a good example here. In 2012, he said to Bart Ehrman, I suspect we don't have too much difference on John. My view is the Gospel of John is a horse of another color altogether. It's a different genre from the synoptics, in other words, he's saying. I think John is studded with historical details. Maybe you call them nuggets. That's not a bad way of describing John, but I think the synoptics are more than just some nuggets. So you can see here this contrast he's drawing between the synoptic gospels as being more historical, John as being less historical. It's a rather sweeping statement. 
then it wasn't just to Ehrman because you might think, well, you know, Bart Ehrman is is giving him a hard time. He's pushing him. Uh, so he, he kind of said something he didn't mean. On the contrary, he emphasized this again to the audience. On a historical level, he said, let us suppose we could go back into time with a camera team and audio and video record the historical Jesus. And we followed him about throughout his ministry. I would be very surprised if we caught him uttering, I am this and I am that. This aspect of the Gospel of John, I would not put in the category of historical. You could say, theologically, these affirmations of who Jesus is, in fact, do derive from Jesus, not because he walked around and said them, but because of what he did what he said, and because of his resurrection. And so this community that comes together in the aftermath of Easter says, you know what, this Jesus who said these various things, whose teachings we cling to and interpret and present and adapt and so on, he is for us the way, the truth, the life, the true vine. He is the bread of life and so on. And so that gets presented in a very creative, dramatic, and metaphorical way in what we now call the Gospel of John. Ehrman um, had picked up on this and had said earlier to Evan, so you would not use the Gospel of John as a historical source for the historical Jesus because you think it's metaphorical. And Evans had said, fair enough. I have transcripts of all of this um, out there that I have typed out. It's also all available on video. In 2018, I debated Craig Evans on the historicity of John on the unbelievable show with Justin Brierley. Um, and it was interesting because he kind of tried to minimize what he had said in 2012, though it is a matter of public record. But as the debate went on, he began saying more and more about this alleged conflict between John and the synoptics until at a certain point he said, and so you have virtually nothing in Matthew, Mark, and Luke that sounds like and looks like Jesus in the Gospel of John. So we have to ask as historians, at this point. Is there just some other Jesus we didn't know about? I guess I'm counting votes. It's three to one. Matthew, Mark, and Luke present him in a certain way. John presents him in a very different way. And I suspect that John is presenting Jesus in a much more interpretive light. Now that's pretty explicit that he's, he's postulating a conflict between the Jesus of John and the Jesus of Matthew, Mark, and Luke. He even says that he's counting votes. And it's three to one against against John. That's very interesting. I'm going to move my screen over a little bit so I find it easier to read my own my own slides. There we go. All right. That's pretty clear. Um, I'm going to come back to that counting votes point later on. Michael Lacona and Why Are There Differences in the Gospels says the relationship of the Gospel of John to history and to the synoptic Gospels continues to perplex scholars. So he's implying that there's some kind of issue about the relationship of John to history. And he writes humorous comment accurately summarizes the thoughts of many New Testament scholars. I feel about John like I feel about my wife. I love her very much, but I wouldn't claim to understand her. Now, I went and looked up the context of that. Uh, comment by Wright, and I don't think he was trying to uh, deprecate the historicity of John quite as much as Lacona likes to use him to indicate. Um, certainly, as it's used here, it sounds like a comment that is not very complimentary either to Dr. Wright's wife or to John the Evangelist. The implication being that John is just so up in the sky uh, that he is impossible to understand. We can't just take him straight. We can't just take him to be presenting straight history. That's pretty clearly how Lacona is taking him. And what's the result of all of this tension that's seen between John and Matthew, Mark, and Luke? It's haste to doubt John's historicity. Now, I have more examples than what I'm going to give you here of the haste to doubt John's historicity. I have chosen these examples because they are cases where there isn't even an apparent contradiction among the Gospels. And yet, nonetheless, we're questioning, scholars are questioning whether John is historical. I call these utterly unforced errors. Jesus' sayings on the cross that are unique to John are doubted, despite the fact that there is no contradiction between Jesus saying, I thirst, and his saying, my God, why have you forsaken me? Nonetheless, both uh, Dan B. Wallace and Mike Lacona have taken I thirst to be ahistorical and to be John's transformation of my God, why have you forsaken me? It's very gratuitous, unnecessary. Jesus breathing on the disciples after his resurrection. This is when he first appears after his resurrection. And he uh, 
breathes on them and says, receive the Holy Ghost. Now, admittedly, there is a theological question that can be raised here. Did they receive the Holy Ghost? And in that case, what was the point of Pentecost? But a theological question or complexity is not the same as a contradiction. Historically, there is no contradiction between Jesus standing up and saying these rather cryptic things and breathing on them when he first meets them and the occurrences on the day of Pentecost in Acts. But this is cast into doubt by a number of scholars, including evangelical scholars, despite the fact that it doesn't contradict anything else. Just right away, oh, maybe John is narrating theologically here. Maybe he's weaving mention of uh, Pentecost. This would not be weaving mention of Pentecost, by the way, into his narrative because he knew he wouldn't actually be narrating it. Very strange theories because John is the redheaded stepchild. So we're quick to doubt him. John the Baptist statement that he was the voice of one crying in the wilderness. They come and they ask John, who are you? And he denies he's the Messiah. And they say, well, then who are you? And he says, I am the voice of one crying in the wilderness. The synoptics do not happen to mention that he said this personally, but they just kick off right away by saying the voice of one crying in the wilderness, quoting that. If anything, these should be seen as mutually confirmatory, that that, that verse from Isaiah was associated with John the Baptist. And then look in John, we find John personally quoting it. That's not how scholars look at it. Instead of saying, oh, I guess, you know, that, that made them think of, of the verse. When they thought of John, they say, ah, you know, in John, it's put, it's put right into the mouth of John the Baptist as if John the Baptist were a semi-fictional character. It's because we treat John as ahistorical. We have a, we have a, bias against John's historicity, even though there's absolutely no contradiction between the fact that the synoptic gospels quote this verse in the narrative, but don't happen to mention John saying it, and the gospel of John has John the Baptist actually saying it himself. And then we have the I am sayings. We saw the questioning of those in uh, one of the quotes I gave from Craig Evans, there is no contradiction between the Gospels. It's not as though, you know, the Synoptic Gospels say, you know, Jesus never said before Abraham was I am. Of course not. It's just an argument from silence and Bart Ehrman will push it and push it and push that argument from silence. And then the evangelical scholars will say, well, maybe this was a paraphrase by John. And they don't mean a paraphrase, not what normally one would mean by paraphrase. Rather, it's supposed to have been that, as Craig Evans said, the Yohanim community reflected upon Jesus' teachings and then dramatized the reflections in these explicit statements, uh, which is fiction. They just don't want to call it fiction, but that is fiction. That's not a paraphrase. But there's no reason to doubt that. That's because of the low view of John's historicity and this, this bias that John is different. So that's the motive for my, my presenting a discussion of only one Jesus from the perspective of the historicity of the Gospel of John. And many more um, gratuitous doubts. But as I say, I'm bringing these up in particular because they are utterly unforced errors. OK, but to the contrary. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to present just some samples of the positive evidence for the unity of the portrait of Jesus in John and the Synoptics. These are just samples. There's way more. I have, I have more categories. I have more examples in the categories, like categories under categories. I have more verses for the categories under the categories in the examples. So please check out my URLs that I'm going to give at the end if you're interested in more information. I'm going to start with evidence of unity from Jesus' personality. Again, I have much more with this, but I'm just going to give a couple examples. Jesus skewering wit. This is one of my favorite. I have a feeling people are going to keep hearing me giving this example in different places, but it's really great. I'm going to give the example of two Sabbath controversies. One of them occurs in Luke and one in John. These are, I emphasize, different stories. These are different stories. They are not the same uh, Sabbath controversy at all. In Luke 13, a woman has come to be healed on the Sabbath who has been unable to stand upright for 18 years. Jesus heals her. She's able to stand upright. Who knows? She could have had 
uh, just a deformation of the spine or whatever. And the ruler of the synagogue is unhappy because it's uh, allegedly breaking the Sabbath to heal on the synagogue. So he begins to speak to the woman and to the other people and saying, why don't you come to be healed on the other six days of the week? I find it interesting that he doesn't seem to have had the courage to confront Jesus. So instead, he starts bullying the people. And then I want to read from verse 15. But the Lord answered him and said, you hypocrites, does not each of you on the Sabbath untie his ox or his donkey from the stall and lead him away to water him? And this woman, a daughter of Abraham as she is, whom Satan has bound for 18 long years, should she not have been released from this bond on the Sabbath day? And as he said this, all his opponents were being humiliated and the entire hum multitude was rejoicing over all the glorious things being done by him. So I want you to notice a what I call a conceptual pun. He says, you will release, you will untie your animal to take him to water on the Sabbath. Why should I not have untied this woman and released her who was bound for these 18 years? And she's a daughter of Abraham. She's surely a great deal more valuable than your ox or your ass. Um, so untie, untie, very rabbinic kind of pun, but he's really getting them. You know, and that's the kind of humor that the audience obviously appreciated. They appreciated his cleverness, his skewering wit, uh, his sarcasm. I have other examples in blog posts. Jesus was a very sarcastic person. All right. In John, I'm going to go to John 5 before I go to John 7. I'm not going to read from it. But in John 5, Jesus heals a man on the Sabbath at the pool of Bethesda. Of course, archaeology has uncovered the Pool of Bethesda and uh, found that it does have five porticos, as John reports, further evidence of his historical intention. He is not writing uh, a historical novel here nor anything remotely like that. He's giving a straight reportage. In any event, when Jesus heals this man, he tells him to take up his pallet and walk. The man obeys Jesus. Then he's stopped by the religious leaders there in Jerusalem who ask him why he's carrying his pallet on the Sabbath. He says, the man who healed me told me to. Then they're angry at Jesus for having healed on the Sabbath, number one. And number two, uh, then told the man to carry his pallet. And then Jesus uh, says that his father is working in him and he himself is working. So they, he's very defiant. He's not sorry for what he's done. And then he's making himself equal with, with God. So they're all the more angry at him. That is in one festival of the Jews. We don't know what it, which festival it was. Two chapters later, we are at the Feast of Booths in the fall. I'm pretty sure this was the Feast of Booths, um, the, the fall before Jesus' crucifixion. And he's gone there, and he's still remembering it. And in his speaking to them, he begins talking about that healing that he did. John 7, 21, Jesus answered and said to them, I did one deed, and you all marvel. On this account, Moses has given you circumcision, not because it is from Moses, but from the fathers. And on the Sabbath, you circumcise a man. If a man receives circumcision on the Sabbath, that the law of Moses may not be broken, are you angry with me? Because I made an entire man well on the Sabbath, do not judge according to appearance, but judge with righteous judgment. Now, he's alluding to a, an actual rabbinic ruling. Uh, if a baby boy's eighth day fell on the Sabbath, they considered that they could circumcise him. That did not violate the injunction against working on the Sabbath. And we actually have Talmudic references that indicate this. Again, more little details indicating the historicity of the Gospel of John. But I want to talk about something broader, which is Jesus' pun or conceptual pun, but of a very different kind concerning a very different Sabbath controversy. You will circumcise a man, meaning a man child, on the Sabbath. Obviously, in one sense, circumcision is making the man less than whole physically. That doesn't mean Jesus is anti-circumcision. He's just making a point, again, in a very rabbinic way. But I made an entire man well or whole on the Sabbath, and this caused controversy, making a man unwhole by removing a part of his flesh versus making a man whole by healing him and making him able to walk. This is very similar to loosing the ox or ass, which is okay with you, but 
It's not okay for me to lose this woman who's much more valuable. Jesus is pointing out hypocrisy in both cases. He's pointing out the rigidity and narrowness of the Pharisees' rules, but he's doing it with this kind of conceptual punning, this kind of wit. It's clearly the same man. When you see that, you say, well, this is clearly the same guy. And that's what we have to see, that it's only one Jesus. All right. I told you so, Jesus. Jesus liked to say things ahead of time and then say, remember this when it happens, because I told you so. In Mark 13, 23, he's talking about false messiahs and warning them but be, that the false Christs will come. But be on guard. I have told you all things beforehand. Totally different context. John 14, he's talking about the fact that he will be going away, that he will be leaving them. In this passage, it's a little ambiguous whether going away refers to his crucifixion or his ascension. He seems to sometimes combine them, but that he will be going away. And now I have told you before it takes place so that when it does take place, you may believe. Same motif. John 16, 1 through 4, he's been talking about the persecution they will receive. They will put you out of the synagogues and so forth. Don't fall away. It's okay. I foresaw this. I have said all these things to you to keep you from falling away. But I have said these things to you that when their hour comes, you may remember that I told them to you. Jesus just loves to set it up. I'm kind of like this too. I like to say, you know, look, I told you that was going to break. And I remember when that breaks that I told you it was going to break. And then it breaks and I say, told you. Okay. So Jesus liked to do that, but in, a, in an edifying sort of way. That it was not supposed to harm them or just be Jesus showing off. It was supposed to rather be Jesus giving them information that they needed so that they could be ready. I forgot to move my telephone and it is ringing. I'm going to go turn it off. Just a second. Out of the many interviews I have given, I believe I've remembered on precisely one occasion to move my very loud telephone to a different room. I'm going to learn to do that more regularly from now on. All right, moving on. Jesus who loves his friends. Now, I had more examples of this in the CAA talk, but I've added some other material later. So I'm just going to give this one clustered set of examples here concerning Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. We find them both in Luke and in John as Jesus' friends. Interestingly, Luke doesn't seem to know what town they lived in. He says they came to a certain village. So he doesn't seem to know that they lived in Bethany, but he tells this very vivid story about them with which we're all familiar, where um, Mary is not helping to serve the food and Martha's unhappy and tells Jesus to um, tell her sister to serve the food. So Jesus says to her, uh, Martha, Martha, you are troubled about many things, but Mary has chosen that better part in Luke 11 that shall not be taken away. And I, I have this note here on my slide that Jesus said uh, in a different place to Simon Peter in Luke, Simon, Simon, Satan has desired to have you. And in John, we find the repetition, truly, truly, I say to you. So this is just a linguistic similarity, probably a Semiticism to repeat that. Um, but the point here is just the way he knows Martha so well, and he knows Mary so well, and he loves them. He's, he's you know, telling Martha to chill out, but he's doing it in a very love, loving way. So then we find in John 11 that Lazarus is sick, and Jesus receives a message, the one whom you love is sick. And John emphasizes he loved Lazarus and Mary and Martha. So Jesus, you know, Jesus loves everybody, right? But that as a person on earth, he has special people whom he loves in a special way, who are his friends. Then we find in John 11, Martha comes out when Jesus finally arrives and Lazarus is dead. And the first thing she says is, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Martha is a very assertive person, and you can imagine her saying that in a somewhat accusatory way. And then she says, but even now, I know that the father will do whatever uh, you ask him to do. Hint, hint. And there's this wonderful little dialogue back there. Your brother will rise again. 
Jesus says. And then Martha says, I know he'll rise again at the last day. Cough, cough. But, you know, I would like it if he would rise again now. She, I mean, she doesn't say that, but uh, seems to be implying. And, and he says, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believes in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And he asks if she believes this. And she says that she believes that he's the Christ. So there's, I wouldn't exactly say sparring, but a kind of, a kind of slightly cryptic, slightly intellectual dialogue going on back and forth with Martha over her pain and her doubt that Jesus didn't come and heal her brother. And then she goes and gets Mary and says, the master's asking for you. And Mary comes and Mary falls down before him and says, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Same thing Martha said, but you can imagine her saying it differently. And Jesus says, where have you laid him? And it says he was troubled in spirit. And they take him there. And, and it says when Jesus was troubled when he saw Mary weeping and the Jews who were with you weeping. And when, and when they tell him, Lord, come and see where we laid him, it says Jesus wept. So when Mary says the same thing, Jesus doesn't try to instruct her or draw her out or whatever. He weeps with her. They have different personalities, and Jesus' personalities, inter personality interacts with their personalities in unique ways. We see this also in John 12. Mar Martha serves at the meal, which is probably at someone else's house, which is kind of amusing um, that she kind of gets involved in the serving there. Mary brings the ointment and pours it over Jesus' feet. Again, that difference between them is maintained. So there's only one Mary and only one Martha, and there's also only one Jesus, because Jesus' relationships with them reflect the unity of his personality and the unity of his friendship with them. So that's evidence of the unity of the portrait of Jesus in John and in Luke. Evidence of unity from shared language. Now, I'm going to go through several examples here kind of quickly. My PowerPoint, I emailed it to Jonathan just before we got started. He has my permission to make it available um, by email to anyone who asks, and you can email me for it as well if you want to see these again. So don't be overwhelmed, but I want you to hear it. I want you to get this remarkable that we're constantly being told by Dr. Evans, oh, there's nothing in Matthew, Mark, and Luke that looks like and sounds like Jesus in John. Really? Let's see. I want to note at the outset the parallels I'm going to give here occur in different scenes, different settings. These are not just John's accounts of the same events. Okay. Matthew 10, 23 through 25, he's talking about persecution, telling them to flee to the next town. This is at, I believe, the commissioning of the 12. And he says, a disciple is not above his teacher, nor a servant above his master. John 15, setting is, is the Last Supper. So it's a completely different setting. And he's teaching them. That's known as the farewell discourse. Remember what I told you. And he's just been talking about persecution. A servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will persecute you also. Now, interestingly, Earlier in the farewell discourse, Jesus also says a servant is not greater than his master apropos of foot washing. But I don't think when he says here, remember what I told you, a servant is not greater than his master. He just means that earlier saying that's also recorded in John. I think he's re referring to this saying that's recorded in Matthew that he gave on an earlier occasion, maybe a couple of years earlier, because here he's talking about persecution not about mutual service. If they persecuted me, they will persecute you also. Same saying, a servant is not greater than his master. Matthew 10, 40. Whoever receives you receives me, and whoever receives me receives him who sent me. Notice the mention of the one who sent. Uh, it's much more of a theme in John. We'll be talking about themes a little later. But that theme of Jesus being sent is from is found in the synoptics as well. And there's a stepwise construction. Whoever receives you receives me, and whoever receives me receives him who sent me. Again, this is the commissioning. Mark 9.37, different scene. Jesus likes this three-step structure. Different scene even in the synoptics. He set a child among them to teach them humility. Whoever receives one such child in my name receives me, and whoever receives me receives not me but him who sent me. Same three-step structure different scene. 
John 13, 20. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever receives the one I send receives me, and whoever receives me receives the one who sent me. Okay, really? We have nothing in the synoptics that sounds like Jesus. And uh, we'll get to something called the Yoanine Thunderbolt a little later. Even Dr. Evans feels he has to pause and say, uh, well, there may be a few verses in, in Matthew or something. Well, no, it's not just a few verses. There's a lot more, as we will see even here, and I have more still. Matthew 7.7. 7. Ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be opened to you. Sermon on the Mount. Very famous saying. John 16, 24. Farewell discourse. Until now you have asked nothing in my name. Ask and you will receive. Just like asking it will be given you. That your joy may be full. Notice too the until now. Which fixes the setting. Okay. The, the Sermon on the Mount is set earlier. Um, although it may be a composite discourse, but this fits with the aphoristic nature of the Sermon on the Mount. Here, Jesus is emphasizing, hey, you guys, you know, you need to ask. And I'm at the end of my ministry here. I'm going to die soon. Until now, you have asked nothing in my name. Ask and you will receive. I don't know why I have all these blank slides in here. I have no idea how that happened. All right. Luke 16, 29 to 31. You may recognize the setting. This is the parable of the rich man and Lazarus. Um, you will remember that the rich man asks that uh, Lazarus would be sent in the afterlife, that he would be sent back to appear to his brothers to warn them not to be, you know, selfish and uh, ignore things and ignore what they were supposed to do for the poor and go to hell like he did. But Abraham said, they have Moses and the prophets, let them hear them. And he tries to argue if someone goes to them from the dead, they will repent. And Abraham says, if they do not hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they be convinced if someone should rise from the dead. Obviously, in the immediate context, the someone who would rise from the dead would be Lazarus that he's requesting. But frankly, I think Jesus has his own resurrection in mind. And that saying, neither will they be persuaded, though someone should rise from the dead, has a lot of applications. But that's a parable. John 5, 45 to 47 is one of these dialogue debate things where Jesus is talking a lot about who he is. Very, very Yohanin, very characteristic of John. But look, he says, do not think that I will accuse you to the Father. There is one who accuses you, Moses. For if you believed Moses, you would believe me, for he wrote of me. But if you do not believe his writings, how will you believe my word? Words, exactly that same theme. If they do not hear Moses, neither will they be persuaded, though one should rise from the dead. If you not believe Moses, how will you believe my words? Go back to Moses. It's all in Moses. All right. This is, this is the same man. Hear his mind. Hear his speech. Hear his ways of thought. All right. Evidence of unity from what is often thought of as Johannine language in the Synoptic Gospels. So allegedly, this is supposed to be evidence of the mind of the author, possibly a community. Craig Evans likes to talk about the Johannine community. Others, including um, especially uh, Mike Lacona, will talk about the author of John. And there's this very strong idea that there was, in the end, at least one author, even if he was a member of this later Johannine community, and that the language of John is distinct to John and is supposed to show us the mind of this, this guy, this author, John, which he is sort of putting in Jesus' mouth and making Jesus sound like himself. Well, let's see. I'm going to start with what's called the Yoanine Thunderbolt. And this is sometimes spoken of as a Yoanine Thunderbolt from a clear synoptic sky. Uh, this is what even Dr. Evans had to sort of wave his hand at. There are just a few verses. I suppose there are just a few verses in Matthew 11. Now think to yourself, if this were quoted to you, I remember my husband Tim was introducing me to this idea. He went and got his Bible, and he just came and read it. Of course, I could tell by the buildup what it was going to be. But he said, what gospel do you think this is from? And at the moment, I hadn't reviewed it. I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and understanding and revealed them to little children. Yes, Father, for such was your gracious will. All things have been handed over to me by my Father, and no one knows the Son except the Father, and no one knows the Father except the Son, and anyone to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. If you didn't know 
that it wasn't in John, you'd think it was in John. What do we have? The theme that he set from the Father, the theme that only the Son can reveal the Father, that's in the, that's in the preface to John, openly written by the narrator. The only begotten Son who is in the bosom of the Father, he has declared him, right? Um, and the Son must reveal the Father to us. But look there, it's in Matthew. This is known as Q material. It's also found in, Mar in Luke, excuse me. Um, and you can't just dismiss it as a few verses. Because as I said, this is supposed to be evidence of the mind of the evangelist who wrote John. Well, nobody thinks John wrote Q. Nobody thinks that. So if this way of talking and this way of thinking, and they will emphasize this because they'll emphasize it from 1 John as well, that it's the stamp of this man's mind and that he's making Jesus over into his own image. And look, it's, it's that guy. It's that same guy. Okay. Um, Michael Lacona will say, I have read 1 John and John many times in the original language Greek, and I am convinced that it is the same person who wrote both. And so we must either think that John is changing Jesus into his own idiom or that John came to speak like uh, Jesus through knowing him for a long time. And because it's so different from the synoptics, I'm convinced that it was the former, that John is changing Jesus into his own idiom. All right, so this is supposed to be a particular man, but that particular man didn't write that. No textual, no, no New Testament scholar thinks that John, whoever he was, the author of John, I think he was John, the son of Zebedee, but whoever they think he is, they don't think he wrote Q. They don't even think he wrote that part of Q, and yet there it is. It's that voice. It's that voice that they think is the voice of John being put into the mouth of Jesus. What's it doing there at all? You can't dismiss it. But we've got more. Perhaps no word is more characteristic. There are others that may be almost equally characteristic, but perhaps no word is more characteristic of so-called Yohanin themes, which get back, packaged together as Yohanin idiom, than witness and its cognates. The verb is martorio, sometimes translated testify. Nouns are martoria, testimony or witness, or martus, a witness. The same came for a witness to bear witness of that light that all men might believe, etc., referring to John the Baptist in the, in the preface, in the words of the, uh, of the narrator. We find that in the mouth of the narrator. We also find in John 3, Jesus says, we speak that we do know and we testify. There we go. There's that word that we have seen and you receive not our witness. Witness, witness, witness. John 5, Jesus says, the Father bears witness of me. My works bear witness of me. John 8, Jesus admits that he bears witness of himself. John 15, you also must testify or bear witness because you have been with me from the beginning. That's just scratching the surface. The words and their cognates in Greek are everywhere in John. So this is definitely so-called Yoanian language. But look, Luke 24, 48, you are witnesses of these things. Same same Greek word, Jesus was probably not speaking Greek. But my point is, if we're going to make a big deal about this Yohanin idiom in Greek, we need to recognize it over here in Luke. Luke, author, again, Acts 1, again, the words of the resurrected Jesus. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses, famous verse. And there are many more references in Acts using this same allegedly Yohanin word. Peter is constantly doing it, of which we are witnesses. Um, and we also find a point noted by Richard Balcom that when they're choosing Matthias in Acts 1, they say that uh, we must choose one who has been with us to be a witness with us of these things, who has been with us from the beginning, probably going back to John 15. You must also testify and bear witness because you've been with me from the beginning which is in the same context as the promise of the giving of the Holy Spirit. So they wanted to choose another witness before the Holy Spirit came as they're waiting for the coming of the Holy Spirit. This, I believe, actually counts as an undesigned coincidence. So witnesses is all over the place, particularly in Luke. Eternal life. There is a theory that John went through and systematically, uh, in the sayings he was going to record from Jesus, got rid of the phrase, um, 
kingdom of God and replaced it with eternal life because he liked that better. We're not just talking about kind of casually, well, they mean the same thing and he's slightly paraphrasing Jesus' word. We're talking about a deliberate systematic replacement with a theological motive, okay? Because life is a big yo hitting theme. And so that's supposed to be a replacement that's going on. I want to emphasize here that we don't have the same, uh, the same phrases and the same sayings in John here that we have in the synoptics. The argument for the systematic replacement is entirely statistical that in places and, and also conceptual well, in places where you might have expected that Jesus would use kingdom of God, he uses eternal life in John instead. So maybe in the sayings John records, even though they're unique to John, Jesus really said kingdom of God. And John was like, well, I like eternal life better. So I'm going to replace it with eternal life. But what do you know? And he, and he does use eternal life a lot in John. Not really so uniquely Johannine as all that. Mark 10, 47, the rich young ruler says to Jesus, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? This isn't even Jesus speaking. This is somebody else. In other words, I guess the Jews at that time really did use, again, they may have been speaking the equivalent in Aramaic, but really did use a phrase like eternal life. So it's not just this thing coming out of the mouth of this late first century person who wrote the Gospel of John. It's, an, it's a much earlier, apparently, first century Jewish expression for a desirable eternal state. Mark 10.30, Jesus is promising the disciples their rewards for what they've given up, and he lists, you know, you'll receive uh, compensation, as it were, and in the age to come, eternal life. There it is in Mark arguably, perhaps, the earliest gospel. Matthew 25, 46, the parable of the sheep and the goats, and these will go away into eternal punishment, that's the goats, but the righteous into eternal life. Same phrase. And yes, the Greek is also the same. It is also a Pauline expression. Uh, in Romans 6, 23, very famous, the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. In Galatians 6, 8, they will reap life eternal, same phrase. Um, again, Paul's just this, this rabbi, okay? This isn't some special yo thing. thing. It's, it's a phrase that was used. So why couldn't John just be selecting places where Jesus used this phrase? If in some given case, he happened to know that it was a, a, a synonym, and he happened to just be paraphrasing in a normal sense of paraphrase and substitute a synonym unconsciously, that would not even be this same kind of theological self-conscious replacement in any event. But I think we have evidence that Jesus and others did use this phrase. These Yohini phrases and themes occur more often in John than in the Synoptic Gospels, but this could easily be the result of emphasis by selection, of real historical teachings. This is just such an important point. We must allow these authors to have the, the freedom to select, but they're selecting from real historical material. It is interesting to me that New Testament scholars are very eager to attribute to authors very convoluted activities, like systematically, self-consciously replacing kingdom of heaven with eternal life, or even more, you know, creatively, dramatically inventing Jesus saying, I am the true vine, as we saw earlier, or even wilder things, replacing my God, why have you forsaken me with I thirst? Very complex activities they'll attribute to the author, but they forget the more normal activities, like just selecting from the actual historical material things that you're interested in, things that uh, teach the theme that you want to teach that would be sufficient to account for the fact that we have these phrases that occur more often in John. Very important point. I can't emphasize this strongly enough. And if you want me to say more about this in the Q&A, please ask. None of the Gospels should be assumed to be giving a representative sample of the frequency with which Jesus addressed a topic or used a word. 
I truly believe that a confusion on this point lies behind a great deal of the treatment of John as the redheaded stepchild. You would almost think that each gospel author had appended a small statement at the beginning of his, of his gospel saying, the usages of terminology and themes that Jesus engages in in the following document shall be taken to be statistically representative of the number of times that Jesus used these terms or equivalent terms in another language and addressed these themes. Thank you very much. So that if we find Jesus in John saying that he was sent by the Father, M out of N times, and it's a pretty high proportion, then we are to infer that John is, in a sense, asserting that Jesus scarcely ever opened his mouth except to say he was sent by the Father. Please pass the lamb, and by the way, I was sent by the Father. No. Or if we find a lot of um, parables in the, the synoptics and we don't find parables in John, that it's as if John asserted Jesus never told any parables. No. The absence of parables in John is not a statistical assertion by John that, that Jesus uttered parables 0% of the time. And again and again and again with all of these, be it witness or whatever other term, being set by the Father, um, kingdom of, uh, kingdom of have, or sorry, kingdom of God, uh, which is more frequent in the synoptics than in John. Neither one of these is making an assertion about how frequently Jesus used these phrases. I want to mention here that selection is precisely an area in which the partial dependence among the synoptics, which I think we must all acknowledge, means that we should not count votes. And it's three to one against John. I could scarcely believe that Dr. Evans used that phrase and I quoted it at the beginning from his debate with me on unbelievable. If I or someone else less accepted in the New Testament establishment were to have said something like that about counting votes and counting three votes for Matthew, Mark, and Luke, that would have been pointed to as a sign of our being out of our depth, not really knowing how scholars look at the synoptics, not knowing about the uh, source theories and how they are viewed as literarily independent. But Dr. Evans did it and, you know, was not challenged. Um, and I can't even remember if I had time to point to the fact that that was a blunder in that, but I have done so since then. It is precisely in the area of selection that we see dependence in the synoptic gospels. Now, I believe that Matthew was an eyewitness of many of the events. I am not saying the synoptic gospels are entirely dependent on each other. So that when we have small little details in Matthew in a scene that are different from those in Mark, I think that may have been something Matthew was adding from his own experience. And I think Luke talked to witnesses that were not available uh, to either of the others. So there is some independence as well, and I think that's great, and it's very important, but they do seem to recount many, a great many of the same sayings, scenes, um, parables, and so forth from Jesus. Not all the same, but many of the same. So when we're talking about statistical representation of Jesus' words and sayings and the kinds of teaching that he did, the fact that we find it similar in the three synoptic gospels could just be a reflection of the fact that to some extent they are either using one another or using common sources and just deciding to recount that same material in a somewhat different way and then john is doing different material so we definitely cannot count three to one that's just wrong that's just incorrect from a scholarly perspective i want to throw one more in here there's an illusion that addressing someone as little children is a Johannine expression. I'm going to try to do this quickly. It's allegedly a special idiom that John might have put in Jesus' mouth. This is based on literally a single occurrence in direct address in John. John 13, 33, Jesus says, little children, I am with you a little while longer. Elsewhere in John 21, 5, he calls them children using a different Greek word, which is paideia. In John 13, 33, he uses technia, which is the diminutive of techna, children. So technia is only in John 13, 33, and then there's this one other place where he calls them children, where he asks, hey, hey boys, did you catch anything on the Sea of um, 
the Sea of Tiberias after his resurrection. Now, we do find this frequently epistle first John. I'm not even going to try to give them all. You can go and look it up. I mean, John in first John uses it tons. And that's why it's thought of as Yohanim. But we shouldn't read that back as though it's equally frequent in the Gospel of John. It's not. It literally occurs only once in the Gospel of John. So to call it Yohanim is a bit confusing. Okay? And we've all known students who will overuse a word more than the teacher they admire does. They're more Catholic than the Pope, as it were. Or they'll put on an accent that's stronger than their teacher's own accent. And with regard to this word, that seems very plausible. And also in Mark, Jesus calls the disciples children tekna, uh, in direct address once children, how hard it is for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. He doesn't use the diminutive there, but Craig Keener has noted that the difference between the diminutive and the non-diminutive was not a very big difference in the language. So literally, we've got one use of technia in John, indirect address, one use of paideia, and one use of techna indirect address in Mark, and this makes it Yohanin? No, it doesn't make it Yohanin. That's just a scholarly illusion. All right, now I'm going to move on to the additional material that I've added for today's talk. Some additional objections to my approach to John that I've been talking about here. Somebody's going to ask me, can't we say with confidence that John changes Jesus' way of speaking, and hence the portrait of Jesus, more than the synoptics do because of this thing called Yohanin idiom? Isn't that just, we've just got to acknowledge that. Well, the short answer is no, not really. Because Yohanin idiom is a big basket. It's, it's an umbrella term that includes many different things, some of which I've already addressed. Remember, once again, the passages used to illustrate Yohanin idiom are not the same sayings of Jesus found in the synoptics. So the argument, again, is entirely statistical. It's not that we have the same saying and then the same occasion, and John gives it in different words, and Olaf is using Yohanin idiom. It's not it. They're, to they're different. They're unique to John. One thing that Yohanin idiom used is for themes, like being sent from the Father. I've already addressed that. No reason to think Jesus didn't address these themes historically as recorded in John, and John selected these scenes because he was interested in those themes. He was interested in reporting them. Favorite terms. Again, I've already addressed that, and that's another thing for which the phrase Yohanin idiom is used. Same answer. We find Yohanin terms in the synoptics, just not as often. What we have going on here is selectivity with historicity. And then we have what we might call pure Greek idiom. Now, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on that here. I have an entire post about this out there. I called it pure style. This is like the use of conjunctions. There were probably, in many cases, translations of Jesus speaking in Aramaic. So Luke makes one type of choice. He translates Jesus speaking with a somewhat greater variety of conjunctions. John makes a different choice. He tends to translate Jesus speaking just using chi over and over again or using no conjunction. That's called a syndeton. Um, there is no reason to think that John's choices are less realistic. I mean, if they're both choosing just how to translate Jesus' Aramaic speech into Greek, there's no reason to say that Luke's is somehow more historical. It's a translation anyway. Okay, and indeed, they may be even more, John's may be even more realistic um, because, and I talk about this more in the post that you can look up, but uh, some of these things tend to be Aramaicisms, such as leaving out conjunctions, possibly for effect, sometimes just, just because, or the use of something called vav, which could function either to mean and or to mean but. And you'll find this thing called the adversative chi in John. Uh, both the narrator and Jesus use it. They'll use and to mean but. We speak of what we know, and you receive not our witness, Jesus says to Nicodemus. Well, we might think he means but or and yet. But if Jesus is speaking Aramaic, this might be a very good translation, and in a sense, an even more realistic translation. And if Jesus was speaking Greek, as he may have been to Nicodemus on that occasion, some scholars believe so, he may have spoken much as he does in John because Jesus' own 
original language would have been Aramaic. So his Greek style may have been more of an Aramaic style. Beyond all of this, as I don't put on this slide, these would be the true trivial paraphrases. These would not be phony use of paraphrase. If John, in giving Jesus words, uses conjunctions a little less often than Jesus does, that's exactly what we use the word paraphrase for in a legitimate scholarly way, not for dramatizing Jesus saying I am sayings that he never historically said, not for making up that Jesus said I thirst when he really said, my God, why have you forsaken me? but just saying it in a somewhat choppier way, perhaps, than Jesus did. So either way, there is no reason to think of John as systematically changing Jesus into his own idiom, putting words in Jesus' mouth, making Jesus over into his own image, and being less historical in the reportage of Jesus' speech speaking than the synoptics are. We have many reasons to think otherwise and many options. All right, here's another one. What about those long, long speeches in John? You will hear this. Dr. Evans certainly talked about that. And I want to kind of bring that up here in my debate. In April, Justin, Dr. Evans kept referring to the I am discourses repeatedly. So Justin Brierley, our host, said, just for all those, I'm not going to put on a English accent, I just won't. Just for all those who are not as familiar as you obviously are with these texts, could you just remind us what some of those statements are in the I Am Discourses? I want to mention a reader named Sean has transcribed this entire debate, so that's available. You can find that through my blog and also the audio of it on Unbelievable. So just enhance Dr. Evans, the opportunity to say what he means by all these references to the I am discourses. Craig Evans, of course, happy to oblige. In John's gospel, and this is one of the most distinctive features about John, is where Jesus just begins to speak at length. You have nothing like this in the synoptics in Matthew, Mark, or Luke. But in John, Jesus will say, I am the light of the world, and he'll go on and on and on. I love the three ons. For many verses, these are the I am discourses, and there are about seven of them, and they're very thematic, very theological. Oops. It would be hard to be wronger about what he just said. It's wrong at just about every point. First of all, Jesus does not go on and on and on for many verses on either occasion when he says, I am the light of the world. I give the two references here. In the first of these, his ensuing dialogue with the Pharisees isn't even about his being the light of the world. They challenge his authority, that he's testifying to himself, and that you're not supposed to do that, and so on. The subject changes immediately, and there's a dialogue. In the second he just, after he says, as long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. And then he immediately performs the healing of the blind man, where he then sends him to wash in the pool of Siloam. He does not go on and on and on on either of those occasions. Very ill-chosen example. And there are not seven places, even seven other places, where Jesus gives an I am saying, and then goes on and on and on for many verses on that theme of I am. Uh, of that I am saying, as Dr. Evans implies, only John 6 concerning the bread of life, bread of life discourse could even plausibly meet this description, not seven. Jesus does not generally speak for longer in John than in the synoptic. So it's also wrong. We find, uh, don't find these long speeches in the synoptics. So that's a, that's a three for... Okay, the Johannine monologuing Jesus is a scholarly illusion. There are not actually more verses of an interrupted speech by Jesus in John than in the synoptic. Surprise, surprise. Something they didn't tell you in seminary, I'm guessing. It'd be great if they did. I, I hope I'm wrong about this. I'm going back to a book published by a Unitarian named James Drummond in 1903, hat tip to my my wonderful learned husband who handed this to me. It's just wonderful. This is a reproduction of just part of Drummond's chart and results. So we have the, the number of verses 
a speech uninterrupted by Jesus, and then we're comparing Matthew and John. So John has a few more of these sort of shortish things uninterrupted between three and ten verses long. A few more of those than Matthew. But then we get to more than ten and less than twenty. Matthew has eight inter un such uninterrupted times of talking, and John has three. We have when we get to more than 20, now these are the real long, long ones, Matthew has four and John has three. So, so much for the monologuing Jesus and John. The longest uninterrupted passages of Jesus' speech occur in Matthew. In 93 verses in the Olivet Discourse and 107 verses in the Sermon on the Mount, the longest uninterrupted segment in John is a portion of the Farewell Discourse. It's 52 verses. John will tend to break up Jesus' speech by reporting dialogue. So they'll ask a question, the disciples will ask a question, or the people will raise an objection or something like that. This is part of why Jesus doesn't go on and on and on for so long in John. Now, the longest discourses in Matthew might be composite. I'm not denying that they might be. But some of them in John, portions, some portions of the farewell discourse in John might also be composite. To say that they are composite is a conjecture either way. The important point is that Jesus is not shown monologuing for longer in John than he is portrayed in the synoptics. However you take it. You can't be dogmatic and say we, it's absolute that he didn't really speak for this long the way the synoptics appear to record him. But it's absolute that he really did, that John really is saying that he spoke for this long. So John is portraying him as monologuing and the synoptics aren't portraying him as monologuing. That's just gerrymandering your conclusion to make Jesus a monologuer in John and not in the synoptics, when as a matter of fact, he's shown speaking uninterrupted for longer in Matthew than in John. It is illicit and misleading to dub dialogues as discourses just in John. I just want to address this. Uh, this is something I didn't address in the debate with Dr. Evans. There is a convention among some New Testament scholars to talk about some of Jesus' dialogues in John as discourses. So Jesus' scene with the woman at the well is called a discourse, although I might just add I don't believe there's an I am saying anywhere in there, so it still can't be an I am discourse. Um, Jesus' discussion with Nicodemus, they go back and forth. This gets called a discourse, okay? Um, or where Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life to the disciples in, um, in John 14. There's dialogue surrounding that, but this gets called a discourse. Now, it's a double standard to say the di there are these dialogues, these thematic dialogues in John, we're going to call those discourses. But when we have thematic dialogues in the synoptics, which we do, such as the dialogue about being a servant leader in Mark concerning, um, you know, the, the sons of Zebedee who asked to sit on his right and left hand. But we're going to call that a dialogue. We're going to call a, a thematic dialogue in, in John a discourse. This is just a way of gerrymandering again the long discourses in John by including other people's language as if it's Jesus' language. Uh, and it almost looks like Dr. Evans was in a sense uh, bewitched by the, his own language, by this strange use of uh, discourse that is applied selectively to John because you'll notice what he said. And Jesus will say, I am the light of the world, and it'll just go on and on and on for many verses. Um, so, yeah, calling, calling the discussion in John 8 all a discourse, even the parts where it goes back and forth and back and forth, makes it look like a longer discourse, and apparently that's what he thought. So he said he'll say, I am the light of the world, and then he goes on and on and on, and literally it's one verse, and in the next verse it's the Jewish leaders challenging him, and in fact on a somewhat different issue. So. The scholars themselves, that's a very good illustration of how confusing this terminology is. But in any event, Dr. Evans cut himself off from saying that he was using discourse in this technical way because he defined it. He was given a chance to define it, and he expressly said he was referring to places where Jesus goes on and on and on for many verses. Now, I want to talk about what scholars may be queuing to, for real, in John. And I have a post about this as well. Uh, when they speak of 
uh, these long, long discourses. What is different? Now I'm going to tell you what's different. Jesus is more repetitive in John. He will stick to one topic for a certain number of verses. Again, not that he's talking for more verses than he is shown as talking in Matthew, but it'll stick to one topic for more verses. And he repeats himself. I mean, my goodness, read aloud. You don't have to, you don't have to go read it in the original language, Greek. No, you could just read it in a good, fairly realistic um, fairly realistic English translation like the NASB or the ESV or something and read aloud uh, Jesus' discussion of his own authority in John 5, the bread of life discourse in John 6. Uh, he's talking about the true vine and other, other issues in John 15, 1 through 17. Notice how many times the word abide appears and the word fruit. And he, then he like circles around, circling feeling. So you'll start with abide, abide, and bear much fruit. And then he kind of morphs into, kind of transitions into commandments. Keep my commandments, keep my commandments. And then he, then he doubles back. And you have abide and fruit again at the end. Kind of a, kind of a beautiful thing. Um, but it's, it's not the way that Jesus' longer ways of speaking are in the synoptics. There he tends to be shorter, more what we would call sound bites or aphorisms. If Jesus is going to tell you in the synoptics that it's better to enter into life maimed than to, and by the way, life, there's that word again, than to uh, have two hands and two feet and go to hell, he'll use hands in one verse and eyes in a different verse. Whereas in John, we would expect him to say approximately three times, you know, in between each one, you know, over and over and over again, it's better to enter into life maimed, you know, not even varying it, than to go to hell unmaimed or something like that. So Jesus is more repetitive. But I think we should ask ourselves why we should think Jesus didn't speak like that. Good teachers often are repetitive. They often are. Good preachers often are repetitive. It would be interesting to see how repetitive Spurgeon is. I haven't done this exercise. Someone else should do this. And yet, they wanted to memorize his sayings. Now, the synoptics, authors, may very well have cut out unnecessary repetition for ease of memorization. In fact, I find it interesting that the very scholars who love the word gist, they'll use the word gist, these, the literary device theorists that I'm debating, they love to talk about the Gospels giving us the gist. If we're going to talk about the gist, What's a very obvious way to give the gist? Cut out repetition, right? If I'm going to give the gist, I'm not going to have Jesus saying four different times, and I will raise him up at the last day. Look at, look at, look at the Bread of Life discourse. How many times he says, I will raise him up at the last day. We got it already. I'll raise him up. You'll raise him up at the last day, Jesus. All right? Now, I'm not saying John couldn't have added a couple repetitions. If you're in a class and you're trying to remember if your teacher told you three times or five times to look in the syllabus before you email him, you may not remember exactly how many times. And if you're recounting it, you may recount it a couple extra times. But you know he said it a lot. I think the repetitive Jesus may, again, be, be very closer to the actual voice of Jesus and even the actual way of speaking of Jesus, the manner of Jesus than the synoptics, but they have a different purpose. This doesn't mean they're ahistorical. It's not ahistorical to cut out extra repetitions, okay, and to make things a little more, a little more brief. For, but we can't really believe Jesus taught in aphorisms all the time, that he never spoke but in aphorisms. So that, I believe, is where the myth of the monologuing Jesus comes from, and um, the myth of the, these long, long discourses in John that are found in the synoptics because of Jesus' tendency in John to stick to one topic longer and to repeat himself. Okay. Now I'm going to back out. I've given you positive evidence. I've given you some responses to some common tropes and some common objections. What's the big picture? There is only one Jesus, and we can see that there is only one Jesus. We don't just take it on faith. Well, yeah, of course, there was only one Jesus. But John gives us a much more interpretive picture. No, 
We don't have reason to think John gives us a much more interpretive picture. The evidence does not support the appearance of a different Jesus in John. Throughout the Gospels, we see the same Jesus. His use of sarcasm, his modes of thought, his rapier sharp wit, his love for his friends, his weeping with compassion, his ability to read thoughts, his characteristic metaphors and turns of phrase, his use of object lessons, it is all clearly the same man. John shows us not an allegorical abstraction, but a solid and intensely real person. And we can see that he is the same person whom we meet in the Synoptic Gospels. Okay, let's go to q and I'm going to click stop share here. Excellent. Well, thank you, Lydia. Um, this is the interactive portion of the program. If you would like to uh, talk to uh, Lydia, you can click the raise hand button at the top of your screen and I will promote you to be a co-panelist and you can ask your questions and interact. You can also submit questions in textual form. If you hit the Q&A button at the top of your screen, you can submit anonymously if you want. Um, uh, let me just say also, uh, um, we should be clear also that uh, the arguments presented here are not merely a uh, rebuttal to the common objection, but actually it's a positive argument for trusting the substantial reliability of John as well. So it's another one of these patterns that we find where you have um, kind of diff different episodes which reflect the same character. And so it's a reason, it's a positive reason to trust mm -hmm. John as well as just a rebuttal to an objection to trusting John. Um, let's go to a hand is raised by Kyle Hendricks. Hello. Uh, hi, Kyle. Hey there. Um, hi, Lydia. Hi. Here, let me, let me minimize this so I can see your face. There. <laughs> okay. So um, my question, uh, maybe this... Maybe I'm asking you to be a psychologist and maybe that's not really a good question, but um, I guess what I'm curious about is uh, you talked about um, these gospels and stuff. And like I said, in my interview with you, um, what your theory, your theory seems a whole lot more down to earth, seems a whole lot more simple. Um, it seems to take into account just the normal way that different people talk, especially about the same event or same historical figure or something like that. And it, takes into account that differences don't always mean contradictions. You need a lot more to just claim that something's a contradiction. But apparently this is what, um, apparently a lot of biblical scholars, including evangelical ones, are not going this way. They're going with more complicated literary or theological reasons for thinking mm -hmm. for why there's diff these differences or even claiming that there's contradictions or something. I guess, why do you think that people are so eager to go mm -hmm. that direction instead of just kind of normal everyday people talk is it because they're scholars and don't talk to people i don't know <laughs> yeah it's it's a good question and i kind of anticipated someone would ask it so um i would relate it to to two things that i brought up in uh in the in the talk uh first of all it's been noted since the time of the greek fathers that john is different from the synoptics so he stands out because he's giving uh, disparate scenes and uh disparate material it's just not found in the synoptics. It's not contradictory, but it's just different. And so right away, attention was drawn to John because, he's, uh, because he is different. So that's part of why I called him the redheaded stepchild, that you notice that this child looks different from the other children, you know. And then um, we've got a couple of faulty assumptions. First, a faulty treatment of Matthew, Mark, and Luke as independent. And it's really strange because of all people in the world, Biblical scholars should know better than that. But you saw it. You saw it yourself in the quotation from Dr. Evans. He's counting votes, and it's three to one. So it's very strange. Suddenly, when it comes to counting votes against John, they literally count Matthew, Mark, and Luke separately. So that's very weird. Um, so that's one thing, false assumption of independence. John's appearance of difference is just sort of striking people. And then the other thing is that false statistical assumption that I mentioned that it's treated as though the number of times Jesus uses phrases or speaks in an aphoristic way or speaks in a repetitive way or um, uses a certain term or whatever is supposed to be statistically representative in the gospel of the way he spoke throughout his ministry. Now, if you make that very strong statistical assumption, then you can get a contradiction because it's like, it's like John is, quote, saying that Jesus addressed this theme, this percentage of the time. And the synoptic authors are saying that he addressed this theme a lower percentage of the time. And it can't be both. He can't be addressing it, you know, a high percentage and a low percentage. One must be wrong. 
And so by that, that tacit statistical assumption, I believe, which is rarely brought out into the open, they produce an artificial contradiction. And then because John is the odd man out, then John is the one who's called more into question. So I, that's my best shot. All right. Well, thank you very much. Thank you, Kyle. Can you make me visible? Am I visible to the people who are? I can see you. Yes, you, you can are. see me. Okay. It's just I'm just not visible to me. Okay. Got it. Yes, I think. Uh, did you minimize your your camera or something? I did. That's what I need to do. I'll bring it back up. Let's see what I can do here. I'd kind of like to be able to see what I'm doing here. Oh, that's too large now. <laughs> I'm being picky. There we go. I've got me sort of medium sized. All right, good. Oh, good. Let me ask you about the the so called messianic secret concept. When we read the a common objection to to John is when you read the synoptics, Jesus is often telling people not to disclose who he really is, um, not to disclose um, mm. what he's done for them and so on. Whereas when we read John, all Jesus seems to do is talk about himself. Uh, so how do you harmonize that? Yeah, good question. I think the Messianic secret is to some extent exaggerated. Um, Jesus is very concerned with who he is, certainly, in the synoptics. So you find him saying to the disciples, whom do men say that I am, but whom do you say that I am? And that's, you know, that's in Matthew. So he's very interested in talking about who he is. But he does, as you say, warn people not to speak sometimes of the miracles or not to tell people that he's the Messiah and so forth. Now, I believe that this is because he's concerned about a false conception of Messiahship and that he's trying to avoid the attempt to make him king, which in fact is found in John. So that's kind of cool. It's almost like an undesigned coincidence that John's statement that they were going to try to make him king by force helps to explain the so-called messianic secret in, in the synoptic gospels. Notice too that the cases where he specifically tells people not to tell about him are all occurring in the north. Um, in, in Galilee, uh, it's in the region of Caesarea Philippi, I think, when the uh, whom do men say that I am, whom do you say that I am, and then he instructed them not to tell anyone that he was the Messiah. The north was a hotbed of uh, messianism and earthly messianism. When Jesus reveals his messianic identity to the woman at the well, she is, in, in John, in John 4, she is a Samaritan. And there was way less reason to think that the Samaritans were going to be out there, rah, rah, you know, um, go lead us to overthrow Rome or whatever, and misunderstanding what was meant by that. So I really don't see a, a conflict or a controversy there at all. I think that uh, John is just, again, selecting and recounting different things which are, in fact, compatible with the things we find in the synoptics. Right, exactly. And uh, um, as you mentioned, uh, John 6.15 says, <coughs> perceiving that they were about to come and take him by force to make him king, Jesus withdrew again to the mountain by himself, which explains then why in various episodes in, uh, in the synoptics, Jesus is seen to try to get away from the crowds. You also see that in uh, John 5, 13, where it says, now the man who'd been healed did not know who it was, for Jesus had withdrawn as there was a crowd in the place. Mm -hmm. um, you see this in Matthew 14 and, and Luke 5 as well. Jesus withdrawn from the crowds without any explanation given. It's only when you read John that we understand, oh, that's why, because they wanted to try and make him king by force because he had this misconception about uh, his messianic role there. Um, and I like the point also about uh, the fact that uh, in John, Jesus, uh, John specifically represents Jesus ministry in the region of Judea a lot more than in the synoptics um, and so they were uh, the very people who were more poised to understand his meaning in the I am statements well I want to emphasize something there I think we should distinguish Jesus saying he was God from Jesus saying he was Messiah mm -hmm. I, I don't think we should combine those um, I think that it, when he made the I am statements or he said, I and my father are one, you see what happened. They didn't try to make him king. They tried to stone him. Okay. So his saying that he was, equal, you know, equal with the father and stuff was not, I think, going to cause an outbreak of messianic feeling. Even if there had been 
uh, messianic feeling sort of brewing in Jerusalem, where he makes most of those statements. Um, I don't think his statement to be uh, I and the Father are one or before Abraham was I am would have been likely to call forth that messianic feeling. And I do think that the messianic secret argument against John conflates whether the deliberately or accidentally Jesus greater statements or more frequent statements of his deity in John with statements of his messiahship. Now, the statement to the woman at the well is a statement of messiahship because she says that Christ will come and Christ means the Messiah. And he says, I who speak to you am he. And there I do think the Samaritans were less likely to misunderstand or to misuse or whatever. But the statements of deity, you know, that just makes them mad. Um, and so Jesus is teaching this because he, he believes he ought to teach it. He needs to teach it. But it's not going to have the same effect as teaching that he's the Messiah. Right. Very good points. Um, an anonymous attendee asks, I've read Wallace's paper on the I thirst passage and I do not find it convincing. However, he says, which Timothy McGrew points out in his lecture at Southwestern, that a caveat lecture should be mentioned as we begin on the analogy of the letter, uh, letter rating system of the UBS Greek text. I would rate my convictions about this proposal as a C or perhaps a C plus, end quote. That means that... Um, or, or, or he says that that means that Wallace is confident in this conclusion are, are tentative at best, and he does not have a high confidence in this conclusion. Thus, what evidence has been presented to Wallace against this possible position he holds? I'm a little confused because I think perhaps this reader is uh, conflating a textual uh, point that Wallace makes, and this concerns whether or not uh, Jesus, a certain saying of Jesus on the cross is in the text. And he, he uh, discusses this concerning, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Okay, that one, he says, perhaps is, uh, may not have been in the original text. So he makes a textual point. Those kinds of rankings, the C plus and that kind of thing, those are given for textual points. He's very confident about the different thing, uh, the change from my God, why have you forsaken me to I thirst? In fact, I think at one point he refers to it as the thesis of this paper. So um, there isn't the tentativity, if I can use make up a word, about that there. In fact, he even replies to attempted objections like well, this isn't, he has a footnote where he says, you know, people I've mentioned this to have said, but this isn't very improbable that Jesus would have said I thirst. Correct. Uh, thirst was a known thing that happened in crucifixion and he says but the question is whether it's likely that john would have recorded jesus saying i thirst well i'm sorry but john did record jesus saying i thirst i mean it's right there in the gospel so wallace has this very convoluted uh theological idea that john would only record that if he meant it ironically in a sense that he would only record it if he didn't mean it historically and to record it historically would be contrary to john's theme of glory and john's theme of jesus as being in control of his crucifixion and that kind of thing and he is not tentative about that conclusion concerning i thirst um so i'm sure he even says some of the reasons that have been presented to him against that conclusion, and he dismisses them. Um, so it's just a very convoluted literary theory that he's become convinced of, and Mike Lacona appears to be convinced of it as well. In fact, he speaks more confidently of that one uh, than he does of some of the other theories he presents in Why Are the Differences in the Gospels? Mm -hmm. Go back to the I am sayings. Uh, I would argue that you can actually find at least two I am sayings in the synoptics, and I'm sure you're aware, familiar with these. And one is in Mark six, uh, which parallels an account in John six, where you have the storm at sea, and Jesus um, appears walking on the sea, and he says, "Take heart, ego I me in Greek, I am. Do not be afraid." Right. It's me, right? Yeah. Right, exactly. Um, it's it's often translated in the English translations as "it is I" or "it's me," it but uh, in the Greek, it's ego I me, meaning mm -hmm. "I am." Um, and the Old Testament connection, which is quite interesting, um, if it is linked to this text, is, is quite significant. Isaiah 43 and verse 2 says, When you pass through the waters, I will be with you, and through the rivers, they shall not overwhelm you. When you walk through fire, you shall not be burned, and the flame shall not consume you. And in verse 10, You are my witnesses, declares the Lord, and my servants whom I have chosen, that we know and believe me and understand that I am. So if, if that is a link to that text, and that is an I am statement, which presents Jesus' deity in the Synoptic Gospels as well. 
Um, sorry, do you have something to no, say? No, go. go. Okay. Um, another example is in Mark 13 and verse 6, where it says, and many will come in my name saying, I am, and they will lead many astray, which mm -hmm. arguably is another I am statement. I think both of these are open to other interpretations, though, in a way that the I am statements, uh, particularly before Abraham was I am, and I and the Father I are one, which is not an I am statement, strictly speaking, are not open to other interpretations. Um, so it's a more tentative conclusion to draw that these are intended to be I am statements in, uh, in Mark. And there's one that, uh, to be tentative about, I think it's in John as well, where they say, we seek Jesus of Nazareth. And he says, I who speak unto you am he. And they fall backward. I believe that's in John. But I would rank, rank that as, uh, unless it's in Luke, but I think I, it's in I, John. Actually, that's, uh, it, he, in, in John uh, yeah. 18, he says, I am. He doesn't say, I, I speak to you, I'm he. That's what he says to the Samaritan woman in John 4. Says, oh, sorry. I speak okay. To you, I'm he. Okay, it's, but I, I am, you know, I'm the one you're looking for. So I would rank that one as tentative for about the same reasons as the ones in Mark, namely that they, you could, he could just be saying, you know, it is I, or I am he, that they said they were seeking, or, um, and so forth. I'm not saying I'm absolutely dead set against them, but they could be. So I, I think we, it's fine to acknowledge, and I would not only acknowledge, but actually insist that Jesus' claims to deity are clearer in John than they are in the synoptics, and that's okay. That's okay. I mean, we all have times when someone has made something clearer to us in one scene or in one opportunity than he has in some other occasion in his life. And if we didn't have the account of that conversation, then that fact about that person would not be as clear. And that's not an, an argument against his having had that conversation with us. It's just that at times a person makes something clearer than he makes it at other times. So I, I would almost prefer to challenge the argument from silence in the synoptics head on and just say that really stinks. That's just really an awful, awful argument from silence rather than to sort of beef up the Christology of the synoptics um, in order to try to put, make them a little more on a par. I think there is a disparity. I think there is a gap. Not that the synoptics assert a low Christology, but that they just don't happen to get around to us telling about some of the incidents in which Jesus was most clear. I actually think that there are quite a few very clear instances in the synoptics where Jesus communicates his deity. One example would be in Matthew 11 and Luke 7, when Jesus is, um, is he's approached by disciples sent from John the Baptist who's in prison, and they ask him, are you the one we're expecting or should we wait for another? And then he quotes from Isaiah 35, and then significantly from Malachi 3, verse 1, where it speaks about the messenger who was sent to prepare the way for the messenger of the covenant to come, who's identified in Malachi 3 as Ha'adon, a title of deity, Jesus identifies John the Baptist as that forerunner, that messenger, and himself as the one whose way was prepared by him. So that seems to prepare you the way of the Lord, right? right if it's yeah. the Lord, you know, then I must be the Lord, right? Yeah. So, you know, it's a little more inferential. There are a few more steps, but, and you have to go back and read the context and, and, and make that inference. Um, again, the more inference there is though, it, you can also say in a sense, that's less, direct. I mean, nobody tries to stone him at that point, for example. Um, the one I consider to be the most direct in the synoptics, of course, is the famous place where he claims to forgive the man's sins. Mm -hmm. Who can forgive sins? And they say, who can forgive sins but God alone? Because yeah. he says, your sins are forgiven. And he says that you may know that the Son of Man has power on earth to forgive sins, rise and walk. That, I think, is pretty strong. He doesn't say, Oh no, you're wrong. I can forgive sins even though I'm just a man. You know, he he goes ahead and performs a miracle as a sign of his authority to forgive sins after he knows they have just said only God can forgive sins. So I think that's probably the, you know, the most direct one. I think it's just real important not to think of anything in John as kind of just inspired by that. I think John is just inspired by history. Yeah. Just one more example, then we'll move on. Mm -hmm. um, and this is also one I think is quite clear. In this is actually in all all four gospels, um, the account of Jesus entering into Jerusalem mounted on the back of a donkey. I think is not just a claim to his messiahship, but also an explicit claim to deity. And here's why: in Zechariah nine, 
verse 9, it says, Rejoice, to, uh, rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you, righteous and having salvation is he. Humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. Um, in chapter 14 of Zechariah, it's, um, it speaks about how the Lord God will himself descend to deliver his people from their enemies in the last day. And it speaks about him coming significantly, his feet touching the Mount of Olives, which, by the way, is, is a description of Jesus' return in Acts 1. He will return the same way you saw him go, and it's very clear they're speaking for the Mount of Olives. And uh, according to Zechariah 14, he comes with all of his holy, all of his holy ones, just like in 1 Thessalonians 3, Jesus is to descend with all of his holy ones. So it's a reference mm-hmm. there as well. But significantly, it says in verse 9 of Zechariah 14, and the Lord will be king over all the earth. On that day, the Lord will be one and his name one. Now, this is, this, this, in, remember in Zechariah 9, it said that Israel's king would come mounted on a donkey. Mm. And specifically, it says, uh, that he would, re- he would reign from shore to shore. It says, I will cut off the chariot from Ephraim and the war horse from Jerusalem and the battle bow shall be cut off and he shall speak to the nations. His rule should be from sea to sea and from the river to the ends of the earth. And so this seems to be the same king spoken of in Zechariah 14, who's going to reign from shore to shore and be king over all the earth. And so if Jesus enters Jerusalem on the back of a donkey, fulfilling Zechariah um, 9, it seems that he must also be deity. I don't think that's escapable. Well, that would seem to result in the conclusion that um, God was trying to teach in the Old Testament that the Messiah would be deity. Because I would say the Zechariah passage about your king comes meek and lowly and riding on an ass is pretty clearly a a reference to the Messiah. Um, And certainly the people themselves did not interpret the Messiah as automatically being God. I mean, he was supposed to be a man who would come. So I think what you're, what you're making there is an argument that really we could derive from the Old Testament that the Messiah himself would be God. Now, that's a really interesting argument and could be especially interesting in uh, Jewish evangelism, dealing with uh, the Jews, and it, it may be what the Holy Spirit intended in the prophecy of Zechariah. I guess I would just see it as more inferential. And I also do think it interesting that the concept of messiahship at the time uh, that Jesus came was certainly not a concept of the Messiah as God. And that is, and they didn't, they didn't get that out of Zechariah. You know, they, however they read Zechariah, they didn't see that as following. And I think that's also important for the point I was making earlier about the messianic secret, that when he revealed his deity he wasn't necessarily at the same time going to awaken their messianic expectations but we can bolster this argument to show that it, i think it is matthew's intent to communicate this it's not just that we're interpreting Zechariah like this so let me show you just from the same text in matthew 21 so we've got uh the quotation from Zechariah 9 verse 9 in matthew 21 uh, 4 and then it says the disciples went and did as jesus had directed them they brought the donkey and the colt and put it put on them their cloaks and Bart I mean completely butchers this. Oh yeah, 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 I know that one. Yeah, yeah. That's funny. <laughs> and he sat on them, meaning the cloaks, not on the <laughs> on the two animals. Two animals. Oh, that's an old one, you know, from yeah, the yeah. skeptics. Yeah. Most of the crowd spread their cloaks on the road and others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road and the crowds that went before him and that were and that followed him were shouting significantly, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. You know where that comes from in the Old Testament? I do not have the reference, no. It's from Psalm 118. But in Psalm, 100, Psalm 118, the Hosannas are being ascribed to the Lord God. But here right, yeah. they're being ascribed to the son of David. But I don't think the crowds understood that. I just think they like to yell Hosanna. I mean, I, it's a, if we take it to be a historical occasion, presumably Matthew's reporting it because that's what they said. Right, right, but it's a direct quotation. You know, it even says in Psalm 118, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. It's coming directly from Psalm 118. Sure, we do have messianic psalms, but I mean, it's an interesting, I mean, I don't know. Are you attributing to the crowds the belief that Jesus well, was God? It, interestingly, what happens next is, uh, so after Jesus cleansed the temple, um, it says, uh, the, bl- um, uh, the blind and the lame came to him, this is verse 14, in the temple, and he healed them. But when the chief priests and the scribes saw the wonderful things that he did, and the children crying out in the temple, Hosanna to the son of David, they were indignant. And they said to him, do you hear what these are saying? In other words, they understood what they meant, right? They think of it as blasphemous. Of right. course, they already have reason to think of Jesus as blasphemous, because remember, he said all these other things they think of as blasphemous as well. Right. So that's gonna, And in, in Jerusalem, too. And so that's going to create a backdrop for it. 
Mm -hmm. um, and I think we see that in our own day. I don't know. I mean, I'm going to give a slightly controversial example, but uh, the way that a Catholic might talk about praying to the Virgin Mary, right? And um, that a Protestant might say, do you hear what this person is saying? You know, about, I cry to you, mother, to come and deliver me. Uh, da, 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 da. You know, can't you see how that's borderline idolatrous? Don't you think, realize you need to stop people from doing this? And the person himself who said it, if you asked him, might say, no, no, you know, I just love her and she's just a human and so on, you know, and might retreat to a more moderate statement. But the person who's concerned about it hears it and hears the, what he sees is the danger, the theological danger in it. And so that may be what you're recounting here mm. as going on in that dynamic, which is an interesting historical dynamic. But notice Jesus' reply. Jesus said to them, yes, have you never read out of the mouth of infants and nursing babies you have prepared praise? And, right, and, and that's Psalm 8, 8 yeah. which is obviously praise for God. Right. So, you know, when I consider thy heavens, the work of thy fingers and so mm -hmm. forth. So sure, he's sticking it to them. He's claimed that he's God. So that's an, I like the Psalm 8 one. That's my mm -hmm. favorite of the ones you and, give. And interestingly, <laughs> in Psalm 8, the, the, um, the mouths of infants and babies are being used by the Lord God yep. to silence his foes. Silence and, his foes. and here, Jesus is using these mouths of babies and infants to silence his foes. So I it think seems that's that, the best one you've got so far. <laughs> right. so it's, but it seems as a cumulative case, taking all those references together, mm -hmm. seems to suggest, I think, quite strongly that Jesus is God. And, but I... I have tons so it would be of sort of like in my, in my Catholic analogy, if the other person said, yes, she is the mediatrix, you know, in your face, right? They're just like, like taking the, the warning and, and giving it, throwing it right back at them. And you could say that in a sense, that's what Jesus is doing here. And I think that's an interesting interpretation of that scene. Okay, mm -hmm. let's move All on. Right, let's move on, yeah. Um, an anonymous attendee says, uh, Paul seems to be pretty careful with the Jesus saying tradition in 1 Corinthians 7 when he's talking about divorce distincting between his words, I think it means distinguishing between his words and Jesus' teaching. Don't you think the gospel writers did something similar? Yes, and we find them doing it. And I, I, like, the, I like the Paul reference, um, but I, I almost even like more when we find it in the gospels. We find it in John quite a bit. Um, for example, when Jesus stands up and says, uh, I believe it's in John 7, he that believes on me out of his belly shall well rivers of living water and the narrator stops and says this he said referring to the spirit who was not yet given so the narrator doesn't have him say something about the spirit there the narrator gives his own gloss that he was speaking of the spirit or in john 2 um destroy this temple and in three days i will raise it up and then they say this temple has taken, been building for 46 years, very specific historical reference, et cetera. And then the narrator says, but he was speaking of the temple of his body. So the narrator doesn't have Jesus clarify. We have several of these. I've given several of these in a post, specifically in John. And so, he, and D.A. Carson has pointed this out too. And Carson says, if the author is so scrupulous to distinguish his own words from those of Jesus, then if there's an occasion when he doesn't, which by the way, there is one in John three, where it's hard to tell, um, when she stops speaking, then we can take this to have been by a slip or an oversight rather than by a deliberate melding. So I definitely, I definitely agree with that. And I think we can find it in John particularly. And I would also add that the inspiration by the Holy Spirit doesn't change this at all. You will see commentators, I have a quote from Craig Keener to this effect that, well, he considered himself inspired by the paraclete who was to help them and teach them all things. Implication, because he considered himself inspired by the paraclete, he didn't think it was a big deal to put words in Jesus' mouth. I mean, I'm sorry, that's a sort of blunt way of putting it, but that's a wrong interpretation of the passages on the paraclete in John, because in John it distinguishes, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever have I have said unto you. They're two different works of the Holy Spirit. And so when the disciples and the apostles would teach what they believe the Holy Spirit has given them to teach, they write epistles or something like that in their own voices, or they write the preface to John in his own voice. They do not put it in Jesus' mouth. Right. Um, an anonymous attendee says, would you agree with this description of an Americanized form of Scottish common sense realism? Timothy Weber writes, quote, according to this worldview, truth was pretty much the same for everybody elsewhere, every, everywhere, 
um, all people possessed a kind of pre-rational intuition for distinguishing right from wrong, truth from falsehood, and facts from illusion. Everyone could know facts directly with a minimum of distortion and speculation and could trust their observations of the world. If you agree overall, how does this have implications in biblical interpretation? It may be that what, what the person is talking about here is avoiding hyper-skepticism and taking, um, say, the Gospel of John or the other Gospels more or less at face value. Um, I'm not sure I would attribute that necessarily to a Scottish common sense school, but I do think it is common sense. Um, I would put it in terms of complexity and simplicity. As an epistemologist, we're always talking about Occam's razor, that we want to uh, invoke entities only if we have evidence for them. Now, I think what you have to realize, what, and what scholars often don't realize, is that when you have a, a gospel author presenting something as if it is historical, but it's really non-historical, we have added entities, which are these other intentions in the person's mind. So take, for example, I thirst on the cross. Okay, so there's the appearance that John is presenting it as a historical saying. He even says the people came and offered him wine when he said this. So it's very much being presented as if it happened. But then you've got this other intention that John has, according to the theory, behind it to, uh, ref to allude in a, in a, in a uh, sort of ironic and metaphoric way to, my God, why have you forsaken me? Whereas you don't have to have that extra complex uh, layer if he really is just relating what happened. So this is something that scholars often fail to understand is that they are in fact violating Occam's razor again and again with, by doing this without evidence. You, you know, you can always multiply entities with evidence. I, if I learned of some new animal living in Africa, then I'd multiply entities. Like, okay, there's an animal I never heard of before, but I would have to have evidence for it. If, if I'm going to believe someone has deceived me, whom I've previously found truthful and who's shown other evidence of being truthful, as I believe John has, and truthful in an ordinary sense, then you're going to need to have extra evidence that John has these ah historical intentions. And that evidence is not being presented to us, which is why I call them utterly unforced errors. So I think that does sort of use the intuition that the questioner was talking about. An anonymous attendee asks, what do you think of D.A. Carson's commentary on John? He does not seem to be a historical on John as much as Lacona. Oh, I agree heartily. Now, I have not read all of D.A. Carson's uh, commentary on John, but I have read portions thereof. He's much less uh, historical. Um, there are just a few concessions that I see him making here or there. He does make one unfortunate reference to the inspiration of the paraclete. Uh, it's just people copy one another. I think that's a major problem in scholarship and particularly in humanities scholarship and especially in biblical scholarship. They hear a phrase and they'll kind of repeat it. But I think Carson tends to mean something a lot, a lot more um, benign by that. Um, and I think, I think Carson does think of John as perhaps changing Jesus' idiom somewhat more than the synaptics. But again, I would suspect it's at a very minor level of, of what we would call ordinary paraphrase, but just thinks it may be done more than the synaptics are. But again and again, Carson is showing a lot of good sense on particular passages. For example, the here's an interesting comment about Carson. I mentioned the passage about Jesus breathing on his disciples and saying, receive the Holy Ghost, and how that is gratuitously questioned as to its historicity. Carson discusses that. He defends his historicity. He does quite a good job. And my only complaint about that passage in Carson's commentary is that I feel that he he treats the question as a more theological question than it needs to be. So he feels that he has to bring forward his own theory about whether Jesus was giving, really bestowing the Holy Spirit or not, and whether this was a metaphorical bestowal and so forth. Those are interesting questions to discuss, don't get me wrong, but the historicity of the passage does not depend upon our having a satisfactory answer to that theological question. And I would have even though he does a really good job, I don't want to be hypercritical here, but I would have preferred if he had said a little more robustly, it doesn't matter. If you don't like my theological theory, Jesus was often cryptic. Maybe the disciples themselves didn't know what Jesus was saying there. We are talking about a literal 
claim in John where Jesus is standing there. He's uttering certain words. He's breathing out breath on them. And this is portrayed. And by itself, we don't have to know what that means in order to think that John is reporting something Jesus actually did. And I would have preferred if he'd said that. But he does defend its historicity. So yes, by a big margin, he's, he's more historical than Lacona or any of these more recent theorists. And I have often said that if a young scholar now were to enter the field, someone unknown, untried, without a reputation, and were to take the positions taken by D.A. Carson, I would also say Craig Blomberg, uh, anew, to start his career that way, I think he'd have a hard time. I think he'd have a harder time in evangelical circles than they do because they're established and respected already and not regarded as rocking the boat because the, the center has shifted since their time. So that's just an interesting comment. So yeah, from what I've seen, from what I've seen, I could, somebody could bring me a passage from Carson's commentary tomorrow because I haven't read it word for word, and I could be saying, oh, that's kind of disappointing. But what I've seen thus far is quite good. And an anonymous attendee says, what do you think of Kurt Jarrow's posts in response to some of your criticisms? Well, I'm just going to speak very briefly about that. I consider them to be very contentless. Um, and this is why I haven't written. He, he doesn't really respond. You can say in response to, but he's, he's not. Uh, in fact, one of the things that has disappointed me most is I'm not just talking about Kurt, but Dr. Lacona or any, anybody, um, that I don't see them coming out with something and, and like going intelligently, carefully. Okay, this is what Lydia's written about the end of Luke, for example, to take an example. Uh, did Luke try to put all the events on the day of Easter. And this is why I disagree I, with Lydia. I think he did, and here's why. That's not the kind of thing that Kurt is writing. He's uh, sometimes radically misunderstanding me in order to accuse me of bad tone. Like the phrase, fake points don't make points. He literally did not understand that phrase and thought it was an insult to Dr. Lacona. It was very strange. My point was an oft-made point, uh, Leanne Morris talks about this too, that you cannot get theological significance in the Gospels from an event that did not really happen. So if Jesus' side was not really pierced, then it couldn't fulfill prophecy for Jesus' side to be pierced. Fake points don't make points. And he like said that, that I'm accusing Lacona of fake points don't make points. So Kurt does not seem to really grasp what I'm doing. And he seems a lot more interested in personalities and personal points. And that's a shame. But for that very reason, I, I have not seen any point in writing in reply to him. I prefer to engage on a more substantive level. Um, an anonymous attendee says, have you read Augustine's Harmony on the Gospels? If so, what do you think of it? Not the whole thing. I've read some portions like his discussion of the genealogies, and at the moment I can't remember what he says about the genealogies, but um, one of the points that I think is interesting is that Augustine is clearly taking these historically. All right. So when we talk about ancient men and how ancient men had a different idea of truth and so forth, Augustine is evidence against that. The very fact that Augustine is attempting to harmonize, be it the genealogies or the different accounts of the uh, centurion coming to Jesus, and those are a couple that I've, I've seen, um, shows that he's taking the Gospels to be making historical statements. So he's getting down into the nitty gritty. You know, and so it's, it's almost more like, you know, Vern Poitras or um, Norm Geisler or somebody that he's like, I take these prima facie to be historical, and then I am trying to harmonize them. And, and very different from Origen in this respect, who despairs far too easily of harmonization and then punts to some kind of uh, allegorical meaning or something like that. We find Augustine, Eusebius, Julius Africanus, um, and these guys are taking a very, a very literal approach to the Gospels, which shows us that ancient men did take a literal, and by, for the most part by and large, that Origen is an outlier. And uh, also Origen, by the way, does not say that it's because they're using ancient literary devices. He says, it, he doesn't compare them to Greek literature. He says it's because they're gospel specifically. And so then they're like a unique thing that has this spiritual meaning or something like that. So even he is not really doing what the modern literary theorists are doing. Um, but in general, in the main, those ancient people were... Um, would have been considered naive if they were writing now. 
because they're taking a very prima facie historical approach to it, and that's why they're harmonizing. Um, an anonymous attendee says, in an essay, C.S. Lewis, uh, he distinguishes between three different forms of religious language, one ordinary, two poetic, three scientific. Where would you place John in this on Lewis's model? I haven't read that passage in Lewis recently, so I haven't seen his further extrapolation on what he means. I would say ordinary, and I would be inclined to say Lewis would think the same. Lewis likens the Gospels, uh, and I believe he specifies, he even talks about the pericopi adulteri, which is interesting because uh, of the textual questions about that, but he likens them to Boswell's Life of Johnson. So this was a memoir written by a close friend shortly after the man had died and that it's close up to the facts and just trying to give you a picture of this man and what he was like. So I do think uh, in that sense, Lewis is taking it uh, to be ordinary language. Um, <clears throat> William Blom asks a question. What is your opinion on the view of some scholars that the Gospel of John is made up of different sources? Example, and this is actually, I think, one of the more puzzling questions about John. In John 16, 5, Jesus says, none of you asks me where are you going? However, in the previous discourse, this question has been asked, example, in 14, 5 by Thomas. Uh, yeah, and Peter as well. Peter says, Lord, where are you going? Earlier in, the, in that evening. Um, I don't see that as evidence of a different source at all. I see that as evidence of accurate reportage because he doesn't try to clear up the apparent contradiction. I mean, it's interesting, you know, we picture these guys as engaging in all of these complicated activities, and it's like they couldn't even be bothered when they were writing stuff down to say, you know, I'm not going to include that because that would have from this source, because that would appear to contradict something that was said earlier. He could have easily done that if he was just copying from a source. Whereas if he was attempting to give what Jesus actually said, and notice he doesn't seem very concerned to guard his high Christology at that point. I think it's a very good good point, because John is seen as, as sometimes massaging the facts to have a higher Christology. But here it's like Jesus just forgot that Peter asked him, or Thomas asked him, where are you going? Okay, and he says, none of you asks me where, where are you going? That's not the only case where um, John doesn't try to guard, he has a lot of subordinationist language and things like that, and I think he reports it because he remembers it. And I think we can we can support that in a sense precisely because of the apparent contradiction. Mm -hmm. uh, Cody Nelson says, how do you answer the common objection that Jesus in John's gospel is more overt about his divinity than the synoptics? We've addressed this already, but you can. Yeah, we, we, we talked about that. I think we really need to just take that Ehrman-esque argument from silence out and shoot it. I'm not saying we take Ehrman out and shoot him. We take the argument out and shoot it. Um, the synoptics do not assert that Jesus hid his divinity. As I've said before, we need to co contrast his hiding his messiahship in certain cultural and geographic contexts from his hiding his divinity. Messiahship and divinity are not necessarily the same thing. And then second of all, um, absence of evidence is not evidence of absence. The fact that they don't report these overt statements, specific ones that we find in John, is not evidence that Jesus didn't utter, utter them. I think a lot of times we, we get a little anachronistic and we think of the Gospels, including the synoptics, as having our apologetic interests. So then we think, well, what didn't they want to defend the deity of Jesus Christ? So if they were out there worrying about defending the deity of Jesus Christ, and they knew he had said this, and surely they would have known, why didn't they report it? That's a very weak argument, um, because I don't think that the synoptics go into this with this, got to defend the deity of Christ, got to defend the deity of Christ, is their, is their major first uh, you know, priority. There's evidence that they do report sayings that Jesus said, like uh, forgiveness of sins, or what you said about um, his quotation of Psalm 8, <clears throat> that, do, uh, that do defend his deity, but that wasn't necessarily their first and foremost purpose. Um, so again, we have to allow each gospel to have its own selectivity in terms of themes without taking this to be an argument from silence against historicity. Uh, let, me also, let me also ask you a question about, uh, uh, or, or raise an additional point relating to uh, 
the true vine saying, I am the true vine in John 15, because you ha actually have in the synoptics uh, passages, texts which parallel that in its theme. So Matthew 7, 19, for example, every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down. Uh, Luke 13 as well, verses 6 through 9. And he told this parable, a man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard, and he came seeking fruit on it and found none. And he said to the vin vine dresser, Luke, for three years now, I have come seeking fruit on this fig tree, and I find none. Cut it down. Why should I use it? Use up the ground? And he answered him, uh, Sir, let it alone let it alone this year also until I dig around to put on manure. Then if it should bear fruit next year, well and good. But if not, you can cut it down, which then parallels uh, John 15, I am the true vine, the father is the husbandman. Every branch that bears no fruit, he takes away, and every branch that bears fruit, he prunes. There's just another example. Which is for the that would be a, a very good example of thematic similarity, like some of them one that I was giving, because these are clearly different stories. One is a vine, uh, which they were probably, they may have been passing is they walked out of Jerusalem at that time. There are vineyards there. So one is a grapevine and one is a fig tree, but this is how Jesus' mind worked. Now, the confusion that a scholar will sometimes do will be to say, oh, maybe this was John's adaptation of the, the story of the fig tree. It's like, no, <laughs> it's just that Jesus thought this way and that he said similar things on different occasions. It's evidence of that unity of concept in both of them. It's just more in uh, Luke of an explicit parable. It's like a story. There was a man. He had a fig tree, etc. And Jesus doesn't do those kinds of stories as much that John reports, probably because they had already been reported. And, and this is actually potentially a counterexample to the claim that John has no parables, because this sounds a bit more like a parable than... It's like on the edge between yeah. an allegory and a parable or a metaphor and a parable. And that's what we do find in John. We find these things that are on that line. But we don't find there was once a certain man who came from Jericho to Jerusalem, etc. Yeah. But I, I actually believe John had uh, the synoptics available to him, by the way. And I know that's controversial, but he it's like as if you had one person's footprints in the snow in, in, in the woods, and then you came and you found another person had passed that way and had stepped in between all of the other person's footprints so that they weren't crossing, okay? And I'm just talking about the selection of scenes and sayings here, not about the similarity of mind, of course, where I think they do cross over, but the, the specific scenes and sayings. John is, in a sense, like the second man coming and stepping in between the synoptics' footprints, and I think he couldn't have done that if he didn't have them. So I think he was deliberately supplementing. Another important point relating to the I am the true vine saying in John is that notice at the end of Jesus' farewell discourse in John 14, Jesus says in verse 31, rise, let us go from here. And then the, the, and then the, the dialogue continues. And the next location given in, is in John 18, where Jesus and the disciples cross the Kidron into the Garden of Gethsemane. Mm -hmm. um, and this suggests that what you read in John 15, 16, and 17 is, in fact, from a conversation that took place while en route between where he had eaten supper with the disciples and the Garden of Gethsemane. Mm -hmm. uh, and they would almost certainly have passed, as you mentioned, by vineyards on the way, which then gives occasion for Jesus' statements in John 15 about being the true vine, etc. although that's not explicitly spelled out in the text. Um, and uh, along the, um, uh, um, the, and the route also to the Garden of Gethsemane would have taken them past the, the sculpted vines on, on the Halda gate, yeah, which, is, yeah. Yeah, which is the most used uh, gate leading to the temple. Uh, and there was also, uh, Josephus tells us, there was also a, a large vine forged in gold on the door of the temple. Um, and Josephus informs us that the trunk of this vine had this circumference of a man. So it kind of uh, illuminates the occasion. I for am the thing. vine, you yeah. are the branches, exactly. et cetera. Yeah, yeah. And that's like Jesus, right? He'll take the child and put the child in the midst, right? He likes to point to things uh -huh. that they can see. I wanted to mention about John 18. One, it says they went out over the brook Kidron. That is used to create a, an apparent contradiction to John 14, where he says, arise, let us go. Because it's like, oh, he already said, arise, let us go. And now it says they went out. So this is used to argue that he didn't really out of that stuff at that time, or that these are invented, or at least composite. I think that's not a good argument. Because when it says they went out across the brook Kidron, that could just be referring to they're going out across the, the, the ravine, okay, uh, which was very uh, 
dark and would have still been rather cold at that time in April. So I don't think that they went out across the Brook Kidron should be interpreted to mean they went out from the upper room. Because then if you take it that way, then you do have a bit of a conflict because he said, arise, let us go three chapters or four chapters before. Um, I just think it means they, they crossed the brook. I think that's all it means. Right. And then we're continuing that conversation on the way there, which, which right. and, and it's interesting that that's not specifically spelled out in the text. And so it's, it's one of these patterns that helps illuminate or corroborate its veracity, where it's, there's something that's, that's, that's quite evident if you read between the lines, but it's not specifically spelled out in the text. It's got a verisimilitude to it. And I would also put into there, like when Judas gets up and leaves and it says, and it was night, you know, just that the visual impression that that made upon the author, that he remembers how these things went. I think the author may have had something we would think of as a photographic or perhaps an audiographic kind of memory, in fact. And it doesn't have to mean that he's quoting Jesus absolutely verbatim. I don't want that to be used against me in that way. But I think he's got a really, really good memory. And of course, uh, John emphasizes in John 3 that uh, people do their wickedness in the dark, right? And right. in the night. You right. mentioned this Nicodemus coming at night uh, mm -hmm. and then Jesus using, and in fact, that's another occasion where Jesus uses the, the scenery around him to make it, to make an object lesson, right? He talks about it being dark and everything, which, which is something which you also see in the synoptics. There's mm -hmm. numerous occasions of where he uses the object to draw his doctrine and his theology, his teaching. Um, he that doeth truth cometh to the light that his deeds may be made manifest. That, by the way, is an argument that the entire passage is Jesus speaking. There is some ambiguity, and one could make the opposite argument that Jesus is done speaking around verse 15. Um, and that what continues as the narrator, that is the one and only place in the gospel where there is actual ambiguity as to whether Jesus continues speaking or the narrator. But the point you've just made concerning the object lesson use and the way this would have been a little dig at Nicodemus, like, are you ashamed to come to me that you're coming by night, um, is some evidence on the other side that it is still Jesus speaking. And on, on the point of Nicodemus, uh, you, men you mentioned earlier about uh, how some scholars think Jesus actually spoke Greek there. And it's interesting that Bartman actually makes this point in his book, Jesus Interrupted, that he actually argues against the veracity of the John 3 episode by arguing that, well, the phrase in Greek, born again, is actually a pun, and, and actually what Jesus meant was born from above, and Jesus mis Nicodemus misunderstands Jesus, and Jesus then clarifies and corrects him by saying, actually, I meant the other meaning. Um, and that pun only works in Greek, but not in Aramaic. Yep. And so Jesus couldn't have said this, according to Bart Ehrman. Uh, but interestingly, um, uh, Tim made this point uh, that uh, Jesus, and actually uh, and there's some recent scholarly work which argues that Jesus actually probably spoke Greek. And I think it's quite mixed. No reason to think argument. Jesus couldn't have spoken Greek. Nicodemus' name is Greek. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Nicodemus' so, name is Greek. And also Jesus has a conversation with Pilate and he was a carpenter. And so he, uh, yep. uh, and so he would have had to have spoken Greek for that. Uh, and that's and, even if you accept the pun thing to begin with. And, you know, I being the rather skeptical person that I am about all literary claims, you know, I'm always trying to pull people down to earth. I'm not absolutely certain that we have to believe that John is telling us that there is that pun on okay. Born From Above. I, it could be a coincidence. But if, if it is the pun, and I'm inclined to think and it is. And they could have just been speaking then, Greek, right, you know. Right, but then uh, it, it, it's interesting that the one time where Jesus would have had to have spoken Greek for that to work would mm -hmm. have been the one occasion where he's speaking with a highly educated man who's a member of the Jewish Sanhedrin and someone whose name happens to be Greek, suggesting he's yeah. an Hellenized Jew. Um, and so uh, it's, it has this ring of verisimilitude about it as mm -hmm. well. And so actually what Bart Ehrman thought was an argument against Johannine mm -hmm. veracity actually is turned on its hand to be an argument for Jehanine veracity. Yep, and you find there one of these uses of the adversative chi that I was mentioning. We speak of what we know and we testify of what we have seen and you receive not our witness. Uh, that's use of chi to mean but, but there's no reason to think Jesus would not have used the adversative chi if indeed he spoke Greek. An anonymous attendee says, why would Wallace say he is using the rating system as an analogy if he is using the rating system from textual criticism and apply it using it on a textual critical conclusion? An analogy would not need to be used, would it? Yeah, I'd have to reread how he uses that analogy, but he is very, I, I guess I'm just, I'm not going to back down on this. Um, he is very confident to the effect that um, 
Jesus, that, that John made this alteration and he spends, concerning I thirst, and he spends many pages arguing for it. Um, and, and so he may in fact be trying to, you know, make an analogy with the way that they use the plus system and the letter system and so forth. But on that particular point, he really doesn't have much doubt. And as I say, when, when Dr. Lacona borrows that from him, he doesn't either. And the other one is it is finished as a dynamic equivalence of um, father into your hands, I commit my spirit. And what I think this arises from is these, the approximate placement in the crucifixion is being overly rigidly interpreted. That's one thing that it arises from, but also just this low view of John's historicity. How much farther, how much longer do you want to go? Do you want yeah, to go it's a bit a few more? minutes after three. So, you know, how many more questions do you have in a queue waiting? Uh, there are two currently. Yeah, let's definitely do those. And then unless a bunch more pop up, we'll probably, we'll probably cut it there. Okay. Uh, an anonymous attendee asks, Wallace ends his paper with, if the suggestions of this paper have merit, does that not show tentativeness? It's the way scholars write. That's the way scholars write. And in fact, he even takes it farther. It's just astounding. He suggests that if the suggestions of that paper have merit, they should be used more widely concerning John. He, in fact, talks, he even goes so far as to suggest this one is more tentative because it's done more briefly. He doesn't spend pages on it. But uh, that um, the, all of that discourse may be represented in John by, in my father's house are many mansions. To my mind, this is just insanity. The Olivet Discourse bears no remote sense of death and destruction and chaos. And, and it's just a modern, very anachronistic idea. Well, you know, it's like the end of the world stuff, right? And going to heaven and, oh, it's so awful. So he actually suggests to his fellow scholars that they should try to like, go find other places in John to apply this, okay? So it's, it's really astounding. And um, he's, he's actually very strong. And this, this paper was a follow-up to one called uh, An Apologia for a Broad Use of Ipsissima Vox, which was presented the previous year at the Evangelical Theological Society meeting. And Apologia is not very tentative, by the way. That one focused more on the synoptics. And then he kept saying over and over again in that one, and if this is true of the synoptics, a for sure, you know, how much the more is it true of John? Because we all know that John is more theological and less historical than the synoptics. So then he says, I hope to explore that in a later paper. And then the paper about um, Ipsissima of Ox and the words from the cross is the paper on John where he's exploring how it would apply. So um, he's not all that tentative. He's really not. And I, again, as I say, if you read Lacona's discussion, he doesn't, when he's talking about these sayings, he says John appears to have uh, altered these words in this way. That's about as strong as Lacona gets. You know, other times he'll, he'll always, you know, very, I shouldn't say always, but very often throw in a word like maybe or perhaps. In this case, he just says John appears to have altered this. Um, and I, I think the very fact that uh, while it spends so many pages arguing for it in terms of John's themes and so forth, so sure, of course, you know, you're going to end a, uh, that's the way you write. You're going to end a paper with, if these have merits, why, what other conclusions might we draw? Um, but that doesn't mean that you actually are in any doubt yourself. And I think that's pretty clear from the rhetoric of the paper as a whole and of the other paper. Because I should add one more thing. The other paper, he's very clear, the 1999 paper, that he believes evangelical scholars do not have a broad enough use of the concept of Ipsissima Vox. And he, he even kind of argues with, against Daryl Bach's uh, Live Jive or Memorex um, paper, which is, is pretty good, I think, but that Bach doesn't have enough categories of their alteration of Jesus' words. So he's very explicit that he's trying to move evangelical scholarship in the direction of believing that the gospel authors altered Jesus' words the more, and, and then that John will be even more so still. And then this is an illustration of that the next year.
William Blom asks, what is your opinion on the view of some scholars that the Gospel of John is made up of, actually, we've already answered that one. We did that one, yeah. Yeah. Um, um, okay, I think that's all the that's questions. All, all the questions. Okay, well, thank you so much for having me. And I think this is, this is interesting. This is going to be useful. And I hope that, that people watch this. And I wanted to do one more thing. I'm going to go to share screen because I have one more slide I want to show. And, of course, feel free, people, to ask, um, ask Jonathan for the slides. And I want to go – oh, no, it doesn't want to go to the next one. Okay. I'm going to show the next slide. There's lots more where that came from. And here are some URLs. I did a tiny URL for my series on John, which is ongoing. I've got, um, this is my web page that's sort of like a portal, okay, for links and so forth. And you can get to all of these. You can follow my public content on Facebook. I don't accept a lot of friend requests, but I am posting more public content, so feel free to follow me there. When I put up new posts, often on New Testament studies nowadays, but not always. And then you can write to me, Lydia McGrew at gmail.com. So I did want to get that one up there. Just a few URLs for people. And once again, uh, feel free to ask for the feel free to ask for the PowerPoint. Okay, cool. Right. If anyone would like the PowerPoint, just email me and I will be happy to send it on. Thank you. All right. Well, thanks, Lydia, for coming on. It's been a real honor and uh, I've certainly learned a lot. I've got some more examples than I had previously, so that's good. I liked that one about, uh, about Psalm 8. I'm going to think about that. Oh, one. good. So cool. All right. Yeah. Bye. All right. Bye.